Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History of Divey Museum. We are very excited. To, um, we're unhappy that um, Heather is out working in the field and can't be on site tonight, but we're happy that we can still do it with Zoom and with technology. So we're, we're very excited. Thank you for all of the, we have a few people here that are in person. Uh, we have a lot, actually like 85 people signed up for our Zoom meeting. And um, we'll also be recording this and then posting it on our YouTube video um, channel for those who couldn't attend tonight. So we want to thank our the uh, Monroe County Tourism Development Council for helping us fund things like this for the Immerse Yourself. And we're tying in with um, Heather Stewart tonight because uh, yesterday, we had our opening of Dive Into Art, Edge of the Sea featured exhibit. We're very excited. It's going to be up until April 19th. So we say don't drive by, dive in. Next time you're in the Florida Keys, we're located at mile marker 83. Um, and that will be up. We've got the Art Guild of the Purple Isles has some fabulous work that's on display, as well as some student artists from 11 different schools in South Florida have um, everything from painted sea grape leaves to huge um, sculptures of birds and animals that live in those habitats near the sea. Another event that we have coming up is Vintage Dive Days in April. And we're, we have all this information on our website, divingmuseum.org. So for those of you who tune in to Immerse Yourself next month, we're going to have Chris Harold, who is a state park ranger at Winley Key. And he's going to come talk to us about those plants that are located around the edge of the sea, the sea grapes, prickly pears, and how you can survive off of that natural habitat. Um, back when there were shipwrecks, they had to rely on this. And now it's just kind of fun. He's also going to bring some sampling so we can taste some of these. It's a great time to come to the museum for that one in person. But tonight, again, we have Dr. Heather Stewart. She's with uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife and currently out in the field studying mangroves and um, telling us more about biodiversity. <clears throat> So thank you for joining us tonight. For those of you that are on the Zoom, go ahead and type in the chat um, who you are, where you are, how many people are with you. And during the course of the presentation, if you have any questions, put those in the chat. Julia is gonna be uh, moderating that and we'll, um, at the end of the presentation, send those out and uh, get them to Heather. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for the invitation to present today and I'm sad that I'm not there in person. Um, like you were saying, we're currently in 10,000 Islands doing some post Ian hurricane research out here with our mangroves so, but we will be there next month and I look forward to seeing the new exhibit. So. Um, I am a mangrove ecologist with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in the Coastal Wetlands Research Team. And um, I have kind of worked with mangroves <clears throat> all across the Caribbean and a little bit of Latin America as well in multiple different disciplines. So I've done community outreach and education as well as ecosystem monitoring like we are doing here and uh, restoration as they did in the Virgin Islands and work with the restoration team here with FWC. And it's, it's great all the different um, aspects within mangroves and ecosystem services that we study. Um, however, my specialties are in the mangrove island biodiversity, mangrove conservation and mangrove coral habitats, which I'll be talking to you guys about today. So before I get into um, some of my favorite parts about mangroves, I just want to give a little bit of a background. So you've all seen mangroves in Florida and um, are probably aware of our three native Florida species that we have here and know that they're an integral part of the ecosystem, particularly in the Keys. Um, but you might not be aware that mangroves are actually defined by their physical and ecological traits rather than their family lineage or genetics. And because of that, the definition of mangrove is more um, of like a botany term rather than a, a genetic uh, definition. So it's a, a tree or a shrub-like intertidal plant that lives along a sheltered coastline 
in the tropics or the subtropics. So within that, they form these distinct ecological communities, and you can find them in 118 different countries around the world. However, because there's not clear genetic distinctions between some of them, um, sometimes there's arguments about how many mangrove species exist um, from 54 to 80. A lot of people say that um, it's around like 73 true mangrove species, but then we also have the mangrove associates, which are closely related to mangroves. So some of the defining characteristics of mangroves are the morphological adaptation that allows them to live in anoxic waterlogged soils. And these are habitats that other plants just can't live in because it's too inhospitable. And so um, in order to live in these type of habitats, they have to have a number of different phys physiological adaptations, such as being able to exclude and excrete salt. So if you're looking at black mangroves out there, you've probably seen the salt crystals on them. Um, also, uh, they're able to, in, in the salt water, be able to make that fairly fresh um, so that they're able to survive. Another thing that characterize mangroves is their site fidelity. So they aren't good competitors with other plants. So you typically find them close to the water where other plants aren't gonna be growing and also in these very salty conditions. And then they're isolated from other plants and contribute a large role into that community structure of the forest. So because mangroves, uh, their development and functioning depends so much on the environment, we can see a huge variation here you can see um, in the picture on the left, one of the key deer, this is in Big Pine Key. And so that's a, a black mangrove. And some of the mangroves in the keys are what we call scrub mangrove or dwarf mangroves. And those mature trees, when they're fully grown are only one to five feet tall. So they're fairly small. However, when you get to areas that are very rich in nutrients and have a high peat content, um, mangroves can actually grow much taller than that. And in some forests in like Gabon, for example, the mangroves can grow up to 213 feet are some of the um, record holder mangroves that have been measured out there. And that's larger than many of the giant sequoias that you find in California. So mangroves are among some of the most valued ecosystems in the planet, and they're valued for their ability to anchor the land to the sea. And they provide a lot of different ecosystem services to humans, and we rely on mangroves to have these very healthy environments. So how are some of the ways that mangroves help us? Well, they can help protect against erosion and flooding and storms. For example, um, uh, mangroves can serve as a buffer by reducing waves from storms by 13 to 66 percent. Um, that percentage varies on how large of a forest it is and the size of those mangroves. Um, so the healthier the mangroves and the stronger the forest, the more ecosystem services that they can provide. They're also essential for preventing erosion. Um, and you guys have probably seen more of these living shorelines um, appearing where we use a combination of green and gray infrastructure where gray infrastructure are going to be your seawalls and green infrastructure are going to be planting mangroves and uh, seagrass and using oysters to try to help against some of the erosion and keep pace with sea level rise. Mangroves also act as a permeable dam, so they can dampen the storm surges that we experience with all these hurricanes, um, and then they can also reduce damage. So it's um, predicted that mangroves prevent about $65 billion worth of property damage every year and are reducing flood risk to about 15 million people every year. So very important. Mangroves recently have been gaining a little bit more attention for their ability to sequester carbon, especially with um, the increasingly strange weather that we've been seeing with climate change and um, with the focus on carbon. Um, a mangrove, for example, if you have uh, one hectare or per hectare, mangroves can sequester five times more carbon per hectare than tropical rainforests. So we typically think of how important tropical rainforests are, but size-wise, mangroves are actually able to sequester more carbon than that. 
Um, mangroves also uh, can store the carbon dioxide in their sediment, which uh, can lessen some of the impacts of global warming. And we call this um, blue carbon because it's stored both in the plants as well as in the soil, where it can remain fixed for centuries. However, that also means that when mangroves are disturbed, some of that carbon can be released. So it's important to um, try not to disturb those areas, which is a concern with uh, some of the deforestation of mangroves that we've been seeing. They can also remove carbon from the oceans. So about 16% of ocean's carbon can be sequestered by mangroves as well. So many people visit the Florida Keys and the Caribbean to admire their beautiful clear waters. And mangroves help with that by retaining nutrients and improving water quality through filtration um, of the sediments and, and removing some of that from the water. Also by providing a substrate that oysters and sponges, which are also filter feeders, can live on the roots. They can increase the clarity of the water as well. So here you can see on the left, uh, some of the mangrove roots in the Caribbean where there's large amounts of sponges. And so those waters are very clear. Okay. Mangroves can also remove pollutants and toxins from the environment and heavy metals uh, can bind to the mangrove soil, which otherwise would be absorbed by filter feeders and can bioaccumulate and can actually poison people if they eat it. So um, sometimes mangroves are used to treat wastewater or to prevent contamination of nearby shores. And some studies have found that they can remove up to 95% of phosphorus and ammonia nitrogen from sewage. However, in doing this, it also has an impact on the mangroves as well. So on the right here, you see this beautiful pink propagule, which is a, a young red mangrove. Um, and the reason why it's pink is because of the chronic oil pollution that um, the, the tree in this area was uh, experiencing. And so that causes a mutation, um, which results in a chlorophyll deficiency and these albino propagules. And then another really important thing is how much wildlife that mangroves can support, both uh, terrestrially and in the marine ecosystems. The mangrove branches are important rookeries for beautiful coastal birds and can provide habitat for over 180 bird species. And their extensive root system is vital for so many important um, fish species as well as crustaceans and, and shellfish. So over 220 fish that we rely upon um, live in the mangroves at some part of their life. And it's very important, especially to Florida's recreational and commercial fisheries. Additionally, mangroves provide homes for 24 different species of reptiles and 18 different species of mammals. So now that we talked about how important mangroves are, which you guys probably were aware of a lot of those different things, but maybe not all those details, despite their critical importance, over um, in the past 50 years, approximately a third of the world's mangrove forests have been lost. And a lot of that is because of direct hum human impacts. And that's led to about 60% of the mangrove decline. And the main cause of this decline is land development, whether that be for um, housing or cities expanding, also aquaculture and agriculture. Additionally, overexploitation of resources, so mining, timber, um, also like shrimp farming, for example, but that would fit more under the aquaculture. And then again, now we're seeing more and more threats due to pollution. And then as we have these degrading mangrove forests, it reduces the ability of the forests to be resilient in the face of future stressors. So with climate change and increasing frequency um, and intensity of hurricanes, especially like what we're seeing here in Florida, mangroves aren't able to keep pace where normally they would be able to keep pace with sea level rise and, and recover from some of these different things. So that's where we come in with restoration and helping um, the mangroves along in their natural abilities to recover from some of these different things. Um, so here on the left, you're seeing that some post Ian damage. Um, you might see, I can use my laser pointer here. 
see. So you can see here, this is some rack line. And in some parts of the forest, we were finding rack line up to 10 feet high. So the storm surge was 10 feet high in those mangrove forests. And there were large amounts of sediment that were put on top of the roots. We can actually choke the mangroves. So those are areas that you know we are concerned about. Also, when water is diverted, whether it's for building roads or for human consumption, we can end up with these areas that um, with the lack of the fresh water coming in and out, they just become too salty, so hypersaline, and can dry out like you're seeing here in the center. And then, um, as I mentioned, pollution is an issue. We lose a lot of nets um, and other waste, and the mangroves are great at collecting all of this. So there are some amazing teams of individuals that have been going out and doing these mangrove cleanups, and I love to see those catching on more and more, um, but we can all do our part to help the mangroves along. So now I'm going to get into um, what you guys came here for, which is mangrove coral habitats. And um, this is a really amazing ecosystem. Here you're looking at an example from Panama where I did a lot of my research. And in this area, there is a very low tidal amplitude. Um, so there's not a huge range in the tides as you see in many parts of the Keys as well. And that seems to be really important for these ecosystems to exist. So in these habitats, we have corals that are growing on the roots or in between the roots within the mangrove canopy. Um, there's many different types. There's lagoon um, systems, there's fringe and uh, canopy. And so it's a fairly new field of study. Um, a lot of people kind of avoided <laughs> studying these habitats because they can be difficult Hello? to navigate in. Um, Hello? So um, I will get into that a little bit more as we go on here. And here you can see looking above at the mangrove canopy. So although mangroves and corals frequently coexist throughout tropical ecosystems, it's not commonly thought of having these corals growing in mangroves. And more typically, we think of them having adjacent assemblages. And with this adjacent assemblage, you have a separate coral reef from the mangrove fringe with sometimes seagrass beds in between. However, in these CMC or coexisting mangrove coral habitats, the corals are actually growing within the mangroves. And so the definition of these nested mangrove coral assemblages is that they're able to establish long-term, so they're not coming in and disappearing, and they're extensive. So there's more than just one or two here or there. And since the system is not well defined or understood, last year we published a scientific review on going back to the literature 100 years to characterize these CMC habitats. And there were several hypotheses as to why corals may be thriving in the mangroves, such as mangroves protecting corals from coastal runoff and pollution, mangrove roots decreasing the water turbidity and stabilizing the shorelines. Um, or that the canopy of the mangroves could be providing shade for the corals, which would re reduce the temperature and light stress. However, many of these hypotheses weren't being tested in the field, and a lot of the data was correlative, so we needed to do some experimental manipulation to determine their significance. So what we found um, by combining both our own observations with the literature were that there were a few basic requirements of these CMC habitats to exist. The first one is that there needs to be a connection to the open ocean um, that can be either a channel or right there at the edge of the ocean within the mangrove stand. And then they also need to be submerged at all stages of the tidal cycle. So corals do not like to be exposed to air. And so having um, that tidal range not be very large is really helpful for the corals to be able to survive in the mangrove system. 
You also need to have limited quantity of freshwater input. Again, corals don't do well with a lot of freshwater, even if mangroves do. So if these habitats are too close to a river, um, that can limit how many corals you're actually finding in these habitats. We also found that there is clear water, um, which you might think of as happening afterwards because of these different filter feeders and so forth. But actually it's so dark in the mangroves that the corals need to have that clear water in order to get enough light to be able to survive. And then you also need high levels of water flow and circulation. And again, that goes back into coral feeding and having enough food for them to survive in these habitats. And then we found a high correlation with crustose coralline algae, which is frequently found to be um, a signal to corals uh, that they can grow in an area. So in our literature search, we found that these habitats occur virtually in every tropical region of the world with the highest numbers of corals occurring in the Caribbean Sea and Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Through the literature and again, our own studies, we found that there were 130 different species of corals that live in mangrove habitats across 12 different locations. And um, one of these locations is the Florida Keys. We don't have a lot of coral species. We only have six that have been currently reported in the mangroves. But if you ever find more, we're always happy to hear about more. And we recently had some students at um, University of Miami who were looking for corals in Biscayne Bay and they found some corals in Biscayne Bay in the mangroves as well. So part of it is looking in the right place. Um, however, with all these studies, it wasn't until 2014 that people started publishing environmental data. And still only half of the locations where corals are being found have any environmental data been collected which makes it difficult to characterize fully these habitats. So we have more general characteristics than specific. So that's something that in this field we're working towards um, trying to narrow down and, and understand better. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of the research that I did in Panama with these habitats. And so, um, this is taking place in Bocas del Toro, Panama, which is an archipelago of largely mangrove islands. And we found 34 coral species that grow in the mangrove roots going about 30 feet into the mangrove canopy. So you could walk 30 feet into the forest and find corals beneath your feet, as you see in that top photo. Um, now we conducted these roving surveys in the area to figure out how common these CMC habitats were. In the map, you can see the green indicates where mangrove forests are present, and the stars represent where CMC habitats can be found. So the color of the star represents the number of coral species. So yellow is only two to four, however, red is more than 10 coral species were found in an area. And as you may notice, a lot of the ones with the highest number of coral species were actually outside of the current marine protected area. Now, these habitats are very fragile and can go by unnoticed. Um, many people don't even realize that they're there until they're directly above them. And navigating these habitats also poses challenges because you have to carefully squeeze in between small spaces, as you can see in the bottom left photo, um, you also need to do a little bit of very shallow free diving because you have to hold your breath as you're going through mangrove tunnels um, where you might not be able to come up for air. And um, when the roots are too dense or the water is too shallow, you have to be able to quickly switch from snorkeling to climbing trees. So after getting a general idea of the amount of these mangrove coral habitats that were occurring in the area, we decided to conduct a series of benthic cover surveys to see what the percent cover of living coral and coral species richness were in the mangrove habitat compared to the shallow reef. And what we found between the two habitats was that they had a similar percent cover of coral However, the coral species richness was twice that in the mangrove compared to the reef. 
So the reef was a little bit more of a monoculture um, with the, the coral species we were seeing there, a lot more hardy species, especially with um, how intense the light can be there and large bleaching events that had occurred in that area. And then we we're finding a little bit more diversity within the mangrove habitat. Then after we did that, we were noticing that these surveys couldn't fully capture what we were seeing. And so we needed to find a, find a, a better way to capture that. So we intensively surve surveyed one of our coral sites that had a little bit higher biodiversity um, than some of the others. And we created this large grid of 10 by 14 meters. And this went into the mangrove canopy. And so what we ended up finding was this zonation pattern where smaller corals were growing densely along the mangrove edge. And then as you got a little bit further in, there was changes in the density and, and richness of the coral species. And then finally, once you got far enough in, it was more um, dominated by one large coral species, but massive colonies, about 1.3 meters in, in diameter. So since we saw this zonation, uh, we decided that we should try to characterize what type of abiotic uh, differences that we were finding between them and environmental differences. So we used these multi-parameter SONs that measured important factors such as pH, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, all sorts of different things that corals rely on for survival as well as fish and, and other living organisms. And we found that the mangrove edge and um, the canopy separated as being two distinct habitats. However, the mangrove edge and the reef flat overlapped in many ways. So they were more similar than um, the back of the mangrove and the edge of the mangrove. And then we also compared this to a little bit deeper of a reef, which also separated as being different. And in the mangrove canopy, we found them to have the lowest levels of dissolved oxygen, lowest pH temperature, as well as salinity, which is where those larger corals were growing. And I just want to show you here. So as these environmental differences are occurring, the morphology of the corals are also changing. So when we're in the mangrove canopy, which is seen in red here, you get this morphotype of corals where they're flattened. And the same species when you're on the reef flat or when you're in the mangrove edge is more of a, a dome shape. So Part of that can be because there's less light, the corals are increasing their surface area to be able to absorb more light. Um, it could also be because the water is more shallow, that way they can stay underwater longer and parts of the coral are not exposed. Additionally, we found, as you can see, difference in morphology here again, this is a mustard coral. So typically you would see it on the reef, um, being the mustard color with the little bumps. And then when we're in the mangrove edge, it's more of a yellow green and cup shaped. And then as you move further into the mangrove canopy, you get more blues and purples and they start to wrap around the roots um, in a number of different uh, shapes. So you may have noticed in the video and, you know, for me talking about it, that in the mangrove habitat, there's a drastic change in light as soon as you go under the canopy and temperatures also drop fairly quickly. So we wanted to try to understand going to that hypothesis that maybe the mangroves are serving as a coral refugia from light and temperature. We want to design an experiment to actually test this and see whether this is the reason why corals were um, more diverse in, in richness in the mangroves versus on the reef. So we created this uh, reciprocal coral transplant experiment where we took the reef and the mangroves and we created two treatments, one light and one dark. The light treatment um, is seen with the little suns and the shade treatment with the clouds. So our mangrove control was just a regular mangrove. Um, as you can see here, we used an A crate and we had 
fragments of corals, both from mangroves and from, from the reef that were put here. And so they were both in naive and home habitats, and that way we could directly compare them. And then for the mangrove light treatment, we used um, little cables to pull back the branches and allow some light into the mangroves. And then we had a reef control that was just regular reef and then a reef shade treatment where we created these shades to see um, whether if we added shade to the reef, if those corals did just as well as if they were in the mangrove habitat. And from that, we found that there was a difference in the amount of bleaching, tissue loss, and survival of coral species in the mangrove habitat. And the species that you see here are the corals that did the best in the mangroves. They were also the species that we found the most frequently when we did these coral surveys. And then when we were looking at light intensity, which is represented here as photosynthetically active radiation, we found that that was the key factor in whether the corals bleach or whether they survive. So more than the habitat of mangrove or reef, it was related to the amount of UV radiation that the corals were experiencing. And so you can see on this gradient of increasing radiation that most coral species had lower survival as light intensity increased. However, one of our brain corals, the sea gnat, they were great, they're a generalist, they did great across the entire range. And then another brain coral, the, the D-Lab, actually didn't do well at all, but <laughs> it is slightly better with more light and um, UV radiation. However, those results could be um, more of a sign that the D-Labs don't necessarily do transplantation well um, and might not be a good coral to use for that purpose. So now to take a step back, um, since I talked a little bit about Florida, I talked a little bit about Panama, um, I want to have us look at the big picture. So here you see the distribution of mangroves across the world in green and the distribution of coral reefs in pink. The overlap areas where these habitats might exist are in yellow. And then, like I said, in all of the studies we are reading, these habitats never occurred where there was a tide that was greater than two meters. And so we created another map where we narrowed it down to tides less than two meters. And then the stars are where these different studies are coming from, which actually fit our map very well. So that made us feel a little bit better about it. Um, and you can see that a lot of the studies that have been done have been in the Caribbean, but there's a huge amount of area where these habitats could be occurring um, in the South Pacific, but there's not that many studies on that er in that area. So it's a pretty understudied and un underexplored region. Also in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf are good areas to look for these habitats. And then I would like to highlight one of my former interns, collaborators, and um, friend Jen, she has been looking at how the presence of corals in mangrove habitats have been impacting fish assemblages. And her study revealed that the CMC habitats harbor distinct fish assemblages compared to mangrove habitats without coral. And that with the ones with the, the coral had greater species richness of fish and increased abundance of herbivores, which are important for um, helping our reefs, like parrotfish, for example, were one of the species. And she also found that the CMC habitats had greater complexity than mangrove habitats without the coral because they both had the vertical relief um, and shelter that you would find from the prop roots of the mangroves, as well as the rugosity and the shelter holes that the coral provides. So these combined factors are enhancing this fish habitat um, that could be driving the fish assemblages in certain regions. And this research was just accepted yesterday for publication in Biotropica. So it should be available soon. So you should keep an eye out for that. So I'm just going to end it now with um, giving you a couple takeaway messages. So what we're finding is that there seems to be these global shifts from these adjacent assemblages of corals and mangroves to more nested assemblages, where we're seeing reports at an increasing rate. 
It is unclear whether that's because these ecosystems are increasing in number or more likely that they're getting more attention now that reefs worldwide are so rapidly degrading. Since our knowledge on these CMC habitats is limited, we must prioritize the conservation of these ecosystems um, as they may serve as a coral refugia, as we found in our study and a couple other studies have found as well, um, by reducing environmental stress, which will become increasingly important with global climate change. And then the knowledge gained from this research demonstrates the role that mangroves play in shaping biodiversity is a very fluid one and that we predict this will continue to change over time. Um, so as the world is changing, um, we should be supporting these ecosystems and, and studying them and see how nature can inform us and how to be the best stewards of the land. So I just wanna thank everybody who's worked on all these different projects with me. Um, this research was done with vast amounts <laughs> of people in um, Panama, Florida, and the Virgin Islands, uh, and was supported by the Smithsonian, McGill University, and the American F Fisheries Association. Um, so thank you all for your time, and I'll take any questions. Um, all this research is open access, so anybody can read it if you would like. Um, and if you aren't able to get your questions out today or think of something later, I have my email here so you can send me an email. Um, and thank you once again. Great presentation. Thank you, Heather. I do have a few questions. Um, some are in the chat from our viewers on Zoom and the rest are from our viewers in person. I'm going to go ahead and start with a couple that we have from our people in, in person. Uh, one asks, how is debris removed when it's deeper in the trees? And the other asks, and have they found lionfish in the mangroves? Oh, those are great questions. Um, so when they're deeper in the mangroves, it can be a bit challenging. We have some amazing people in Florida that are hiking into the mangroves and, and carrying these out. And um, there's a, a number of different organizations that have been doing this that you can join if you're interested in doing so. Um, and then also we do have some mangrove cleanups that you can always join in on. Uh, it is a very difficult habitat to get in and out of. So not quite as popular as beach cleanups. And as for the lionfish question, I don't know. I haven't seen any lionfish in the mangroves, but that does not mean that they're not there. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from our viewers in, in person, what can local residents do to help? And are there is there citizen science, are there any citizen science groups uh, here in the Keys that are helping? So we don't have any citizen science projects going on right now where people can report these um, habitats occurring, but that is something that I would like to start up. So um, if you do see these habitats, you can reach out to me. I had my um, personal email address there, but you can also reach me at heather.stewart at myfwc.com. And um, you can report it there. And as we start to develop a platform for citizen scientists to report this, then I can redirect people there. But at this time, that platform doesn't exist yet. Uh, this is in a similar vein to that question, uh, but this is from Murdoch, age 10. He wants to know if there's anything that his school in Nags Head, North Carolina can do to help mangroves. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's all sorts of things that you can do, even if you don't have mangroves in your own backyard. Um, there are a number of different groups that have been partnering with different um, organizations to, to help with mangrove conservation and restoration. As I was saying earlier, mangroves do really well at recovering themselves. They just need time. Um, however, sometimes people have to step in. So when there is an issue, for example, with the water flow um, being altered, we do have teams that come in and they put in culverts or dig out channels and help restore that flow. And um, you guys might be familiar about the restoring the flow in the Everglades. So it's the same concept that, you know, if we help 
nature do its thing that it will recover. Um, so I can um, maybe pass along a couple resources after this that people can look into. Next question is from Steve. He says he noted that black spiny sea urchins were living amongst the coral at the mangrove roots in some of your photos. Is this a good sign? <laughs> so it depends on who you are. Sea urchins are a natural part of the ecosystem. And in a couple of different areas, for example, I was in the Virgin Islands, we were having die-offs of sea urchins where there was a disease passing through and it was killing a lot of sea urchins. Um, some of the sea urchins are um, rock borers, so they can actually cause damage to the corals, whereas other ones eat algae um, and so they can be beneficial. So it really kind of depends on which species and the quantity. And as long as you know nature has that balance, then we're good. It's more of an issue um, when there's not that natural control. And um, one little story I'll share with you guys is when I was in Panama, we had this large algae bloom that came in. It was in the mangrove coral area. It was also on the reef where large um, brain coral that were probably decades old, if, if not a century, they were massive, um, about the size of me. And they end up getting covered in algae. And it was about two months that they were covered in algae. And those corals had large die-offs. However, in the mangroves, all of a sudden we had these sea hares appear and they started grazing the algae in the mangroves and we did not have the same die off of coral in the mangrove habitat as we did on the reef. So in having these combined ecosystems with both the, the mangroves and the corals in the same area, it attracts different biota, so different wildlife in there, which can actually help keep um, some of these areas in check. All right, great answer, thank you. Um, Karen asks, does climbing or crawling on the mangroves damage them? It can, so you have to be, you have to be careful with it. Um, some of the roots before they're, um, the, the roots develop in a number of different ways. So with the black mangroves, they have the nematophores, those are the straw-like roots. And with the red mangroves, they have drop roots that come down from the canopy and then prop roots, which um, go to the ground and can strengthen and help support the tree. So if you have a healthy live tree with um, large prop roots, you can walk on those without damaging the tree. However, if that root is fairly new and um, isn't fully stable, so if it's very flexible and you put all your weight on it, you can end up damaging it. So you just have to be very careful. So we have a role in the mangroves, three, point, um, yeah, three points of contact at all times. So either two feet touching ground or mangroves and a hand or two hands and a foot. And so as long as you follow that rule and you don't put all your weight on any one area until you know it can support yourself, you can both prevent hurting yourself and hurting the mangrove. All right, our next question is from Bob. He asks, what are your thoughts on the expansion of mangroves into new areas such as the Everglades due to sea level rise and saltwater intrusion? So mangroves have been growing in the Everglades. That's actually one of the places that I first saw mangroves and where I fell in love with them. Um, but there is over time um, an expansion and a retracting of mangroves in many parts of their range, but the, the US is one of their more Northern parts of their range. And so um, we are seeing an expansion of like black mangroves in, in North Florida, but with the colder winters, sometimes those die back a little bit. Um, we also see them in a couple other states. One of those states that you might not expect is Hawaii. So in Hawaii, people do not like mangroves there because they're not one of the native species. And so it can be quite controversial because um, people do like mangroves and the fish seem to like them there, but they're not supposed to be there. And so um, that can get a little bit more complicated. So we, we try to support them where they're supposed to be. <laughs> 
Okay, great, thank you. Um, Steve wanted to know, he said, the Red Sea looks interesting. How are the mangroves there surviving? So I haven't seen it in person yet. I've only read about it, but um, the mangroves there are actually growing on black mangroves. So they're growing on those small little roots, the pneumatophores. And there's not a lot of species, but there's a handful of species there. And so that's one of the areas that I would like to go myself in and check out. Um, but those studies were, were done um, many years ago. And so I'd be interested to see whether they've um, expanded and grown from then and if there's more species being found or if that's something that might have changed and maybe those don't even exist there anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeffrey asks, can you please explain carbon sequestration in mangroves and its benefit to the environment? I, I will try to do the simple version of it. So, so um, yeah, so there's a carbon dioxide in, in the air and um, mangroves are able to store a lot of the carbon that is in the air and in the water in the soil that is all around them, as well as in the tree itself. And so by doing that, it prevents that from escaping. And then that you know, leads to um, degradation of ozone and, and climate change um, concerns. So uh, we try to support these systems like the, the mangroves and the seagrass that are able to sequester some of this carbon. Um, and yeah, I think that I think that I'll just stop it there because it gets quite complicated. So okay, uh, this is another question about how to help mangroves, but this is from Rocio in Southern California. He says there are no mangroves there, but are there different ways that people in California can help? <laughs> yeah, I mean, similar to the, the North Carolina question, um, there's lots of different places that do have mangroves, um, and we have a number of different partnerships. So when I was in the Virgin Islands, we even had teams from Iowa who would come down and, and help with some of the restoration and conservation projects that we we're doing. Um, a lot of the areas where mangroves grow uh, don't necessarily have a, a lot of support from the government. Um, and so any way that, you know, they can be um, supported either, you know, in, in supporting the government to help protect these areas or, or financially, there's, there's a lot of different things that we can do um, also in how we live. So um, like in, in Asia, for example, one of the major threats to mangroves is shrimp farming. So just being aware of what you're eating and how is it being harvested? So you can have an impact, um, you know, in the middle of the U.S. just by thinking about where does your shrimp come from and making sure it's coming from places that are not cutting down mangroves to build shrimp ponds, for example. Okay, um, this one's from Lana. She is referring to a question that you answered a little while back about an algae bloom that was occurring that was showing up on some corals. She wants to know uh, how did that happen? What caused it, the algae bloom? So with, with a lot of these al algae blooms, um, this is not the harmful algae that you that we see here in Florida. This is just a, a regular algae. Um, so a lot of it's coming from high levels of nutrients. So the islands where I was working and living um, had a lot of development occurring and um, they don't have the same septic systems and, and treatment that we do. So there's a lot of nutrients going into the ocean um, there. And then that combined with these large amounts of time with high water temperatures, you have nutrients, you have warmth, and algae loves it. So it just kind of takes over um, and they can end up choking out a lot of different things. So that's where it's important to have some of our grazers like the parrotfish can um, help reefs from becoming degraded. And in that region, there were some issues with parrotfish being overfished. And so they weren't there as a natural control. And then we had um, die-offs of diadema, which is the type of sea urchin that can also be helpful. So the more animals that were missing out of the system that would control the algae, and then the more positive 
conditions that we had for the algae just led to the whole scale being tilted towards algaes um, doing better than the corals. And we're kind of seeing a lot of that worldwide. I was just at an international coral reef symposium in, in Germany, and um, there was a whole symposium all about phase shifts from coral reefs to these algae reefs because algae is taking over. Okay. Um, this next question is actually a twofer. One is from Jeffy, the other is from Robert. Jeffrey asks, he says, two recent Florida hurricanes have left large swatches of dead mangroves for a couple of years. They seem to grow back fairly quickly. Is that a normal weather cycle situation? And Robert um, asked a similar question. He says, what is the prognosis for mangroves that are completely destroyed by storms, as in they have no leaves left? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you touched on that. So with Ian that just came through, we did not start our mangrove monitoring until after three months because a lot of the mangroves in the beginning can look dead and it can be very difficult to tell whether they're alive or not, but within three months, they'll start to grow leaves. Um, and so some of the, the mangroves, like the, the black and the white mangroves, they can actually grow leaves directly from the trunk of the tree. And so they can use um, the cells that would normally uh, be used for growing branches and so forth and change it to do that. So it's that advantageous growth that can occur. The red mangroves can take a little bit more time to recover because they don't have the same capabilities. So we typically see the blacks and the whites coming back a little bit quicker and then the reds come in after that. So we are seeing recovery a lot of, of a lot of areas, like one of the ones we went to today that we thought was going to be really bad because they had been hit by Irma and then again by Ian was actually not as bad as we thought it was going to be. There definitely were dead trees and we did see the ground changing. So instead of being a nice firm ground like you would normally find in the mangroves, it was turning more into a mud. Um, however, there were enough young trees that that should help um, prevent the whole peat collapse. So when the mangroves have this massive die off, we call it a mangrove heart attack, which can sometimes happen after these hurricanes, when the hydrology is changed and they no longer have that fresh water, um, they can end up having uh, actually water pile up on top of it and they, they suffocate and that can cause the, the peat to collapse. So one of the big things that we try to do is go out to these areas, do monitoring, figure out what areas need help and what type of help they do need. And then our mangrove restoration team here with FWC then will come in and um, follow our recommendations and do what they can to try to restore those areas. And then we come back in and see how the restoration process is working. And a lot of people think of planting mangroves, which you can do, um, but typically restoration starts with identifying what the issues are and trying to stop those stressors. And so the biggest thing we can do is pick up a shovel and get the flow back to where it should be. Um, but there are all sorts of great groups out there um, that are also raising mangroves and, and planting mangroves as well. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we have two more questions. This first one is from Alan. He asks, are there any stinging organisms in the mangroves above or below the water? So I guess that question is, are you in danger when you're climbing among <laughs> mangroves from getting stung by anything? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that these areas might have been ignored in the past because they can be a little difficult to get into. Um, they also have a lot of creatures in them that people aren't typically fond of. So um, I swam with a lot of sharks in the mangroves. Uh, I occasionally didn't see them. They snuck up on me, but you know, usually there's, there's no issues with that. We do get a lot of stingrays in the mangroves. Um, you can find crocodiles. So when I was in Panama, a lot of the areas we were going in had crocodiles around. Um, and then when you get into like the South Pacific, there's a, a lot of <laughs> dangerous organisms that can live in the water in the mangroves. And then above the water, uh, you'll, you'll find a, a decent number of wasps in certain areas. In Florida, I don't 
sea wasp as frequently as they did closer to the equator. Um, but again, it kind of depends on the habitat and there's all sorts of amazing things you'll see out there. So um, this week we've been seeing a lot of manatees and dolphins around the mangroves. Uh, when I was in Panama, there's sloths that you find in the mangroves. Um, you'll see monkeys, all sorts of really incredible wildlife. All right, our last question is from David. Do you know of any large scale mangrove restoration projects? Actually, I'm gonna be <laughs> visiting one later this month. Um, so there, there is a big one here in, in 10,000 Islands. Um, and so that one, I, I don't have a full background on it, so I can't, I can't speak to it too much. Um, but I believe that one is the largest one that we have in Florida currently. Um, there have been some massive restoration projects that were more planting in, in certain areas that had no mangroves before. Um, and those it, were not super successful. But we've been learning a lot um, as like a whole community. And what I'm seeing more and more is these groups that are communicating with each other, not just about what they're successful with, but failures as well so that we can learn from each other and not make the, the same mistakes over and over again. So if you're interested in you know, learning more about some of the mangrove efforts out there, there's this great group called the Mangrove Action Project. And um, they teach a, a theory of mangrove restoration called community-based um, ecological mangrove restoration that is based on um, one of uh, our, our biologists here in Florida, um, Robin, and that type of restoration seems to be successful and uh, focuses on working with nature, learning from nature, and working with communities to have these successful restoration projects. So um, there's a lot of really great information on their, their website. Great, that, that's some wonderful information. And you know, after seeing all the student artwork and everything that has gone into the Edge of the Sea exhibit, the research that we've done, um, having you kind of bring that, I never thought there was so much coral underneath the mangroves at the edge. I mean, that's fascinating. And some of those pictures showed such healthy looking coral. So that's very reassuring. Um, so anyway, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, I saw there's a, there was a lot of students. There was a lot of people. I think a lot of science teachers were telling people about this. So we got some really great questions. If you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, put your question in the uh, comment box and we monitor that and we'll get back to Heather and, and give you some updates. So thank you very much. And uh, we also wanted to offer you all of our members or all of our speakers a, a one-year membership. So next time you come down to the Keys, you'll get it to get into the museum 362 days for free. I know you don't have that much free time because they have you out in the field but we'd love to have you um, come down and see the Edge of the Sea exhibit while it's on display or come down after that and, uh, and just visit the museum and, and spend some time with us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I look forward to seeing the new exhibit. The videos and pictures I've seen so far have been amazing. Oh, good, good. Glad you like it. So thank you everybody else for participating tonight and have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you.